Welcome once again to a wonderful Sunday here at NBCC. We trust you all had a great week. For those who were a part of the Zoom meeting this morning, we trust it blessed your hearts. We continue celebrating our Sundays with the time of worship and the sermon series Gospel Centered Life at Work. Hoping this online service will bless you abundantly. A very good morning once again. We continue with our teaching series Gospel Centered Life at Work. We are in part six, and we've titled this week's talk as From Slaves to Sons and Daughters. 
This week we're going to be looking at this aspect of freedom. The freedom that we have to serve God. And so from the slaves to sons and daughters. But we're going to be addressing this topic of freedom. In order to get a deeper understanding of freedom, we need to understand what freedom is not. Right? Subtle opposites, subtle words, opposites of the word freedom are words like dependence, restriction or liability. But a more rich and a more intense a word that describes the opposite of freedom is the word captivity or in other words slavery. So this morning we're going to be using these terms. We're going to be understanding a few Old Testament and New Testament Bible passages that talk of these terms and then try and draw applications for us uh, today. But just to start off Let's start with establishing our identity in Christ as we, look, we are going to be looking at the topic of freedom and uh, uh, being moving from slaves in our work life to working as sons and daughters. But it's important for us to establish our identity in Christ. In the book of John, in the opening chapter, uh, verses 12, John chapter 1 verse 12 says this. To all who did receive him, that is Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And I think this term, children of God, which is which has actually come about because of our spiritual adoption, our sonship, is the very essence of experiencing restful security and confidence. In understanding and embracing our sonship, our adoption, we actually experience restful security and confidence. But in short, because of the gospel story, because of the gospel, the truth about God and us is this. God does not treat us as mere slaves and as mere workers. He does not value us just for what we do. But because we are his sons and daughters adopted in his family, uh, enjoying the rights of sonship, we are loved for who we are in Christ. We are loved for who we are in Christ. What we do never defines who we are. We were made to work. We addressed this a few weeks back. But we, were, but we were not made for work. We were made for God. We were made for His uh, glory. We were made for His uh, friendship with Him and intimacy with Him. We are made to work. We were created to work, but not for work. And so what we do never defines who we are. Our relationship to Jesus matters far more. And so keeping with this title of from slaves to sons and daughters, what is very interesting in, in, in most of the uh, uh, authors of the letters in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you have people like Peter, Paul, James, Jude, and even John. They specifically start some of the letters that they've written in the New Testament with a declaration of their bond service. To Jesus. We're going to be looking at, uh, you know, what's the original meaning of bond servant. We're going to come to that in a, in a few moments from now. But it should make us wonder if Paul and Peter and James and John and Judo, all of them specifically introduced their letters with, with, with declaring of their not just service but bond service to Jesus. It should make us wonder what the idea meant, what, what was the idea that meant to them? And how can it impact you and me today? So a biblical or a historical context of bond servants. In biblical times, in ancient times, bond servants were people who were trapped in a situation, who were trapped in a circumstance that actually cost them their very freedom. Because they were in debt, they had to sell themselves to a master for a period of time and then use that money to pay off what they owed. 
Then they served their master until they had worked off their debt to him. But sometimes, and we're going to be looking at a verse in scripture, but sometimes the servant did not want to be free even after his uh, a period of uh, serving his time. He did not want to be free. He had a preference to continue serving his master. He had a preference to not just continue serving his master, but making that arrangement permanent. Those who had been mistreated would not choose to stay back, would not choose to, you know, to be permanently a bonded servant or with the master. But however, those who, who could actually say in, in the book of Exodus chapter 21, it, the entire detail is there and it's all even re, uh, retold in Deuteronomy and we're going to be looking at those verses. But for those servants who could actually say, I love my master, I will not go free. They could stay on and work as servants because of a gratitude and trust because of their love for their master. Let's look at this from the lens of the gospel. We know, like, like uh, you and I, like them actually, like the people in the Old Testament, like these servants who chose to uh, stay back, like them, you and me, followers of Christ, believers who belong to Christ, Christ has paid the debt of us and freed us of spiritual bondage. In reality, we owe our entire lives, we owe our freedom to the work of Christ on the cross. And we choose to serve him as a bond servant forever. Christ's bond servants serve him not because they must, but because it is their desire. They know that there is no better life apart from serving Christ. I'm going to repeat that. Christ's born servants, even today, serve Christ not because they must serve Christ, but because it is their desire. They know that there is no better life apart from a life of service to Christ, apart from a life of having Christ as their master forever. And so, Let's just come back into the topic of, of today. We're looking at freedom of serving God in our work. And we've seen things in the lens of the gospel. We realize that the gospel frees us not just to do the right thing in our work, but also to genuinely love God and genuinely love the people around us in our workplace. Even when we disagree with co-workers or we know what they're doing is wrong, we are still called to love them. God wants us to reflect his character and love for others while we still stand up for righteousness. That's God's desire that we would reflect his character of love and mercy and grace to the people around us and, and, and at the same time stand for what is right, stand for righteousness and stand for justice. But this balancing act of showing love and grace to people and at the same time having to stand for what is right, it can be hard. It's, an, it's a balancing act that can seem to be a little hard. It's almost impossible, not almost, it is impossible. It's impossible to balance this act out unless we are relying on God, unless we are relying on the Holy Spirit. We need to ask the Spirit to, for a grasp of His promises and His power that overrides and overshadows our fear of people or the motivations and values of our workplace. I'm, I'm just going to say these three statements and just consider and ponder as I think about these three statements as I read it out. If we believe that God is our true master in our workplace, and if we truly believe that he will take care of us in our workplace through difficult times, we will be more open and more loving with others instead 
of protecting our reputation and kind of buckling under work pressure. If we truly believe that Christ is enough for me, if we truly believe that Jesus is enough for me and his help is enough to resist the pressures of the crowd around me, we will be willing to pay any price for Christ to be seen in us. If we truly believe that Jesus is enough for me, we will be willing to pay any price for Christ to be seen in me. If we are truly relying on the righteousness of Christ, we will stop trying to look better than others at work. We will stop looking down on people who are not good at their work. And now, now when we understand work and the freedom that we have in our work through the lens of the gospel, it brings in meaning and reason and purpose for why and where and how God has placed us where he's placed us. Okay? The purpose of making these three statements is really to address that we are potentially not operating our work from a place of freedom. Our natural tendency, our natural inclination is not to operate from a place of freedom. We are usually still enslaved to God substitutes. And we've been talking of God substitutes for a while now. We've been looking at idols in the heart. We've been looking at uh, false saviors. All these terms are synonymous. We are usually still enslaved to God substitutes like slavery, like security, like career prospects, like money, like recognition, wanting fame and wanting glory. And as a result, we are not free to serve God in our workplace. It's probably, probably because we, our fame and our visibility and our identity at work, keeping our recognition is more important. It's not a bad thing. It just becomes more important. It becomes more essential to us than to work and serve Christ. But I'd really like to encourage you and I to consider the beauty of the gospel uh, this morning. God loved us, consider this, God loved us when we were his enemies and the work of Christ on the cross frees us from the power of sin and that changes us. All these things that I just mentioned about security and prospects of career and money and wealth and recognition and fame and glory, all of this has a dark side as well. All of this has a very ungodly, all of this has a sinful side as well. All of these has the potential to love Christ less and love these false saviors and God substitutes more. But because God loved us even when we were still his enemies and sent Jesus to free us from the power of this sin, of sin really, it changes us from the inside out when we put our trust in Jesus. Christ gives us the power to love all that he is. And who is he? He is truth. He is honest. He is integrity. He is he's a man of integrity, goodness. And our desire is transformed and conformed to want to become like him. Even in our workplace, he gives us the power to love all that he is, the person of Christ. He even enables us, because of the gospel, he even enables us to love others, to seek their benefit and to even bless our enemies, to even care for our competitors at workplace, isn't it? God's generosity towards us allows us to give more than what is required of us, to respond above and beyond in generosity towards others. To think more deeply about God's generosity to us helps us give more than what is required to our work in our workplace, right? To think more deeply about God's generosity, let's look at some of the origins of biblical servanthood in Deuteronomy chapter 15. And I'm reading from verses 15 to 17 and then later we will understand its fuller meaning in the New Testament. Okay, uh, not, that, not that the text in Deuteronomy is not full in itself, but we get a fuller meaning, we get a more rich understanding 
uh, when we look at it through the lens of the gospel and therefore the New Testament. So, so Deuteronomy 15 verses 15 to 17 says this. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and he lo because he loves you and your family and is well off with you. And hear this clearly. Take an awl, push it through his yellow into the door and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your female servant. Understanding the text in the context of history, okay? The bond servant allowed his master to pierce his earlobe with an awl against the door of the house. An awl is a small pointed tool and uh, I hope at this time the image of the awl comes on the screen. It's a very clear statement that you cannot kind of uh, pierce an awl through the earlobe, through the doorposts, through the door of the house without blood coming out, isn't it? And so because of that blood, uh, come, through that, through that whole imagery, they are permanently attached to the household, to that master's household with the master and his, and his work over there. As a mark of this bond, it was the custom to put a gold earring after the all was removed with a simple, and this is important, with a simple voluntary act. The slave or the servant with a simple voluntary act, the servant would be swearing his own life and blood to never be free again. He was swearing to never be sold to any other master again. These servants were no longer serving in the master's house to pay a debt. They were already finished paying their debt. They were no longer serving to pay their debt. Rather, they desired to be members of the master's household who would be permanently cared for. As trusted parts of the household, these servants would usually be given stewardship over more of your master's affairs than their typical servants. And although they were still servants, although they were still servants, they were treated more like members of the family. They were given more freedom. They were given a greater freedom and greater status and a greater responsibility. The desire to become part of the master's household flowed from a love and understanding of the generosity of the master. I'm repeating that because that is the that is so crucial for us. The desire to become part of the master's household flowed from a love and understanding of the master's generosity. The freed man or woman who became a bond servant experienced something so positive that he or she was willing to put himself at a risk. And think about this you and me today. We are living in so many centuries after Deuteronomy was uh, written. But when we experience true freedom in the gospel, our natural response is gratitude. That's the natural response. And a desire to serve the master who's paid, who, who pays our debts, puts his resources at our disposal, gives us his family name. Now we see glimpses of this even in the New Testament. In the story of the widow's offering, in Mark chapter 12 verse 44 it says, as Jesus narrates the story of the widow's offering, he tells, the others all gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. What we see, what it looks like to respond to God wholeheartedly. The poor widow completely trusts her master to provide for her needs. She's giving her all and completely trusts her master to provide for her needs. Instead of giving 
just a tenth of her income as it was commanded in scripture. She is giving all that she ever had because she knows for sure that her master, who is also her father, will and can take care of her. We see it in the story of Barnabas. Acts chapter 4, 36, 37 says, Joseph and Levi from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, Barnabas meaning the son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money, put it on the apostles' feet. Barnabas sold his property and gave the proceeds to church. What compelled such extravagant action? We see it in the story of Paul. In the story of Paul, uh, in the book of Galatians, when we did uh, a few weeks back the mystery of grace, we already addressed it. Therefore, I'm just going to go uh, briefly. His, he talks of it more uh, intensely. In Galatians 1, chapters 9 to 12, I'm not reading the entire uh, uh, passage, but in verse 10, it says, If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And that word servant of Christ, the word servant in the Greek word is a, is a Greek word called doulos. Doulos literally means slave or bond servant. Okay, and so uh, Paul actually in this passage is saying those who serve out of either a fear of man or trying to please man or trying to win God's approval are putting themselves under a curse because both are impossible tasks. Both lead trying to find uh, 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 serving because you're fearing people or serving because you're trying to win God's approval. Both of these leads to destruction. It does not lead to salvation. Paul explains that and we read it and we studied it a few weeks back when we did the uh, Mystery of Grace uh, series from the book of Galatians. The only real path that Paul sees in serving Christ is because of gratitude for what Christ has done for him. That's the only possible real path that Paul is saying the reason I'm a, I'm a bond servant of Christ is because I have I, I'm grateful for what Christ has done for me. Our natural inclination is to live for ourselves. That's that's the natural tendency for us. We want to live for ourselves. We want to live for our own desires to be right. We want to our natural incl inclination is to be vindicated. Our natural inclination is not to get into trouble, not to get into situations of dilemma, not to get into controversial issues in our in our office. But what does, and I want to really leave this question with you to ponder, what does our gratitude for the love that Christ has shown us, for the freedom that Christ has won us, what does our gratitude for his love and freedom compel you and me to do? The leading of the Spirit will compel us, causes us to do more than just live for ourselves. To do more than just live for ourselves. It doesn't just teach us what's a right conscience and what's a wrong conscience. In fact, it does that. But more than that, it also teaches us to rely on the power of God. That's what the Spirit does. It teaches us to rely on the power of God. In a remarkable, in a significant, in, an, in fact, in an unimaginable way, the leading of the Spirit uses us, He uses, he uses us to recreate, to change, and to redeem, and to restore our broken world of ungodly work. He uses you and me. You're not just simply working in one of these IT companies for nothing. You're not just simply working as a as a uh, as a mother for nothing or as a, or as grandparents for nothing. Because of the gospel and, and, and because of the leading of the Holy Spirit, God uses you and me to recreate to change, to redeem and to restore the brokenness of the work in our world. That's so important for you and me. And as, as soon as we lose sight of this, as soon as we lose sight of this, we begin, we incline, we are tempted to live for ourselves. And this is how I'd like to conclude and end. 
with this key question. Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 to 20, Paul says, You are not your own for you are bought with a price. Now actually in this particular passage, the context he is addressing is sexual immorality and he talks of how uh, you know people need to move away from sexual immorality and he gives reasons on why but towards the end of that particular chapter that particular passage he gives a very broad framework of uh, of the work of the gospel he gives this very broad you know uh, uh, theology you are not your own for you are bought with a price the ultimate question i remember hearing talk uh, hearing a talk from Ravi Zacharias as he was speaking to uh, an audience of young students and, and I'm, just, I'm just paraphrasing the entire thing. He says, the ultimate question is not who you are, but whose you are. Corinthians reminds us that we were bought for a price. You are not your own. We were bought for a price. The ultimate question is not who you are, but whose you are. Of course, many people may think that they are nobody's slave. They dream of total independence, but the truth is this, that we are either governed by sin or we are governed by God. We are either controlled by sin or we allow God and the Holy Spirit uh, uh, to control us. In Christ, we are indeed free. In Christ, we are indeed free. But the gospel does not speak of a freedom where we can now control and govern ourselves. The freedom that we have because of the gospel in Christ is the freedom to desire what is good. You and I have the freedom to desire what is good. We have the freedom to choose what is good. A whole new way of life opens to us when the death of Christ becomes the death of our old self. Relationship with the living Christ replaces rules. And therefore, I'd like to end with this encouragement and this reminder, a gospel reminder. Christ suffered and died that we might be set free from sin and that we might belong to him. That's, that's one of the reasons Christ died. You are, you are not your own for you are bought for a price. Christ suffered and died that we might be, uh, uh, that we might be set free from sin and we might belong to him. Here is where obedience to Christ stops becoming a burden. Here is where obedience to Christ ceases to become toil, a, a toilsome burden. It becomes the freedom of bearing fruit in our lives. Obedience becomes the freedom of bearing fruit in our lives. Remember, you and I, we are not our own. We are bought for a price. We are Christ. Whose will you be? The answer is we are Christ's. Let us remind ourselves that we can come and belong to Christ. Thank you for listening to me. A few announcements for this week. Please continue being a part of Wednesday evening study on Zoom at 8 p.m. Please consider partnering with NBCC in serving slum dwellers of Hinjawadi Man area. Generosity is a deeply spiritual rhythm of grace at NBCC. A generous God gave His one and only Son for our redemption. We believe that in giving of tithes and offerings, it frees us from trusting in riches. Bank details will come up on the screen.
God's love and grace of Christ rest with all of us this week. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and stay blessed.